Uh, kia ora um, Yeah, my name's Phil Edgar. I'm the Program Manager Digital here at Te Papa. Um, going to be working through the slide with, with Adrian. Thanks for choosing our presentation this afternoon. Um, my part of the uh, 79 slides is actually only the first 10. So I'm kind of standing here with a, a wave behind me waiting to, to engulf you. It's a good wave though, and that's really what the presentation is about. Um, it's really about the results of what's happened since um, we went live with our open access project in June 2014. So I'm going to introduce, um, introduce the topic, talk a little bit about the, the what, the why, and the how, and then Adrian's going to, going to show you some of the results, um, some of the response we've had, um, some of the uses of our images, and what's coming in the future. So what do we do? Well, in June 2014, we made 31,000 images downloadable for free in the highest resolution that we were able to. We did this through our collections online website. I'm sure um, many of you will have used it, I hope. Um, it offers a website that provides access to our digital collections, um, provides access to 500,000 collection records, and 130,000 of those with one or more um, images. Um, the total museum collection size is around 1.8 to 2 million objects and specimens. The images we made available were 17,000 images under a no known copyright restriction statement. Um, these images can be used, uh, can be remixed, can be shared, and can be used um, commercially. And these are images um, of the collection of out of copyright two dimensional works such as paintings and photographic prints. Alongside those, we made 14,000 images available under Creative Commons. Um, non-commercial, no derivatives licenses. These are images of artworks where copyright has been transferred to Te Papa, or where they are commissioned artworks uh, commissioned by Te Papa, or where Te Papa owns copyright of the image where it's taken images of out of copyright three-dimensional objects. So I realise there's a reasonable amount of detail there, and I'm not here to unpick the detail. Um, but Victoria is giving, um, Victoria Leachman, the rights manager, is giving a presentation tomorrow as part of another um, creative, Com creative Commons and Open Licensing session. And that left the rest, which was all rights reserved, which is still about 70,000 images in that pool of collection objects and collections online. These are images that have any third party copyright, um, images of, of Tanga, traditional knowledge, or identified Māori subjects, and images that's, whose status had yet to be assessed. So we're constantly, well, Victoria is, constantly going through our collections um, and clearing more copyright and changing the licenses on, um, on images of our works. So why do we do this? What do we hope to achieve? Um, we, we wanted a great sense of achievement, like, um, like these individuals. Um, but we realised that for our, our collections in the digital space to be relevant, um, access is no longer about seeing something on a screen, and we need to make those images available for use and reuse um, as much as we can. And we want our, our collections, our digital collections, to be, to be relevant to people. We want them to be for people to use them in their own ways, to use them for learning, for teaching, um, for creativity, for inspiration, for innovation. And we need to step out of that as much as we can. This, of course, fits particularly with two of our strategic priorities, access all areas, which, of course, um, is familiar to all of us attending this conference, um, but we share our collections, our skills, and our knowledge with, with the communities around Aotearoa, New Zealand, and overseas. But also in our envisioning process we went through recently, this, this notion of mana tonga and sharing authority, that Te Papa will share decision-making with iwi, communities, and individuals with respect to managing and understanding their tonga and treasures. And for us, um, in the digital space, open access and shared authority really map onto each other so well and it provides a great strategic direction for us in digital at Papa. And of course, um, many individuals have come to, to the NDF and told us to do this, um, no least the Rights Museum who, um, who provided such great inspiration last year. Um, we're not the first museum, library, or gallery, or archive to be doing this work, of course, and we've received great inspiration from those um, coming to us at NDF and talking about, about open access. We recognise that um, 
as a national museum, we want to lead in this, in this area. We want to, to bring people along, bring other museums and galleries along with us and try and push some of the boundaries in the space where we can. And we recognise that for a lot of our, our visitors, they expect this sort of access now. They expect to be able to use our collection images. And if we don't, um, if we can't enable that, then we're likely to be ignored or simply worked around or, or worse ignored. We also want our collections to exist in many places on the web. Uh, we want to be part of collaborative projects. We want to be part of, of innovation. And, and a lot of that, such as the Google Art Project or Wikimedia or the Digital New Zealand Mix and Mash competition. And we've been hindered in our abilities to be part of those projects over the years through our licensing framework. So the more we open up, the more we can be part of the collaborative initiatives that we want to be part of. So, it's been a reasonably long journey, of course. This have, hasn't happened overnight. And there have been a lot of, of obstacles, a lot of hoops to jump through. Sometimes those hoops roll away, um, as the image suggests, um, but not without a lot, a lot of work and effort. Um, one of the key levers for us over the last few years was in 2010 when the New Zealand Government Open Access Licensing Framework was released. Um, this provided a great level within Te Papa to push the open access boundaries and Victoria Leachman, our rights manager, put a paper to our leadership team shortly after NZ Goal was released. And our leadership endorsed NZ Goal at that time. We did have a commercial pitch library though, which whose set up, was set up at the time to, to generate revenue. And a provision was included in that paper that said we were only going to make uh, low resolution, essentially 640 by 640 images available um, for reuse. So of course, that's not, uh, not particularly useful to a lot of people and that, that was immediately evident to us. Um, so the next couple of years have been, have been really following on from that debate, following on from that tension and keeping the discussion going. We had a new CEO about three years ago. We've got a new one started Monday, but about two or three years ago we had um, a new CEO who started a visioning process. And a lot of the discussions and debates in the digital space were around this notion of, of reuse and the tensions with um, needing to protect or wanting to protect some sort of commercial, um, uh, commercial benefits from, from sale and licensing of images. But through that process, we and discussion, we shifted our picture library from a strictly commercial part of the organisation and realigned it alongside our, our digital collections team who are responsible for our digitisation programme and, and collections online. So it took them out of a strict, strict, strictly commercial focus to also support the public good and uh, generate revenue where they can. So this allowed us to balance, um, balance up the public good with, with still retaining some commercial revenue from, from media sales and licensing. So those are the two, two key avenues which have allowed us to progress um, the open, open Access project over the last couple of years. So Adrian's going to take over now and take you through what happened at the launch in June 2014 and what's happened since. Okay, and I'm going to go really fast. Um, so we had a brand new website, um, it was fancy and responsive, um, we had all the images that we'd been doing all the way through, we had uh, centralised information, um, particularly rights information, so we'd been building up a lot in the back end to actually enable what's happening, and we had institutional buy-in. Um, but we did need, uh, we needed to develop a new image API to actually make the images available for download. We needed to really seriously think about language and layout to make it really, really clear, um, and we spent quite a lot of time on that. We wanted to keep it as simple as possible, not put any barriers in the way at all to put people off, but we did actually want some data, so I'll talk about that a bit. Um, we used a caption generator to help the user attribute our works rather than making it hard. Uh, we want them to do it so we'll make it easy for them. Um, we needed to make decisions around delivery formats, um, and so rather than delivering 800 megabyte TIFFs, um, we settled on JPEGs, but at the, exactly the same size as the highest resolution we have available and as uncompressed as JPEG can be. Um, and we knew that would meet probably 99% of users' needs. So this is what a page looks like. Um, and if I can get the laser pointer to work. Um, it's all about that little download button there and that little CC license there, which takes you to this page, um, <coughs> which then gives you a very clear rights statement and license, um, asks you a few questions, but you don't have to fill them in, takes you to a download, um, shows you how big 
the images so you can see, click download and it's yours. Um, and so that's for a natural science, so it's a um, Creative Commons licensed. This is for an out of copyright image, so no known copyright restrictions. And again, it's, it's a nearly 8,000 in the longest dimension file. Um, 11 megs compressed, it'll be about 60 megs uh, uncompressed. Um, that's full frame, but that's the quality that it gives you at 100%. So you see this lazy guy down here? Can you find him now? Um, so he's there. So that's the kind of resolution that we're able to deliver and we're not restricting it. Um, we're going with what we have. And on what we have, uh, we've been digitizing for 15 years or more, so there is a variety of the sizes and quality of images we have available. But what we did was um, we did an assessment to see what kind of sizes we had going to be making available. Um, and because of the variety of ratio of image sizes and compression types, whether it's uh, grayscale or RGB, all those kinds of things, you can't use any real consistent measure except uh, megapixels, which I hate, but it is a consistent measure. Um, so when you look at it, 61% are 10 megapixels or bigger. Um, and another 24 are actually bigger than four. So there's actually a very small chunk that are, that are less than four megapixels. So we were reasonably happy with that. But if you're going through and trying to download lots of stuff, you will come across a few that are a little bit small. So we launched. Um, we did a press release because we're a national museum. Um, it had to go through the Ministry of Culture and Heritage because they wanted to take credit, even though know, they hadn't done anything. Um, <laughs> we did a blog, as you do. Um, we tweeted. And that tweet was very popular. Um, we were excited, so we tweeted again. Um, and with a little bit more about how to do it, um, giving some examples and getting a little bit too excited, um, apologizing for getting too excited. <laughs> um, and then we started showing about some of the sizes. So you know, these, some of these images are really big. And um, we wanted to make sure that people actually understood that. So what did that give us? It gave us um, a two-page colour spread in the New Zealand Herald, which we weren't really expecting. Uh, lots of local print coverage, um, except for the DOM. Um, it gave... We were on French Youth Radio. We didn't know that was going to happen, of course, so they were just talking about the release, um, talking about the collection. But social media was where it really happened. Um, those tweets travelled around the world for three days, and it was really interesting seeing them go. Um, the last continent was South America, for some reason they were three days behind. But it's really interesting watching Te Papa and 30,000 in different languages throughout the tweets. Um, 5,000 views of the blog post, which for us is big. Um, three negative tweets, and they were all about the type of CC license we're using. Um, we responded, and we said, don't forget all the no known copyright stuff, and it's better than nothing. Um, and really good blog coverage from other people. Um, I've blurred out the ads because I don't like ads. Um, so, free technology for teachers in an American blog, a very well received American blog. Um, the, I forget the so various universities around the world. Um, the Crane Brothers, so suit makers, um, stumbled across the, the press release or the blog and uh, <coughs> went looking for suits. And they found a castaway suit and wrote a blog about it as part of the release. Um, open culture, fantastic. They're obviously going to promote this kind of thing. Um, and then this guy. Uh, Corbin, who's a French technology blogger that, of course, we've never heard of before. Um, he blogged about us, saying it was great. Um, and he had a big impact on our metrics. Um, in terms of referrals, he was number one for the week. 3,000 referrals just from that blog. Um, the Herald gave us 1,200, Open Culture 1,200. Uh, Free for Teachers gave us those ones. Um, so that's excluding Google. but. This was direct referrals from actually having communicated what we'd done. Uh, so this is the country for the first week, and you can see France is second, and that's all because of Corbyn. Um, so the, um, the country list is in a very strange order as a result of the, uh, the marketing, much stranger than it would usually be. It would usually be New Zealand, Australia, the United States, etc. This is the first month. Um, this is of traffic to collections online. So you can obviously see where we announced the download. Um, it kind of, the traffic has gone back to relative normal, um, which is a little bit disappointing, but um, clout is a really clumsy measure. Everybody hates clout, but it does give you some kind of pattern. We went up 10% or 10 points. Um, 
so 50,000 blog uh, collection views, which was a 60% increase for a month, uh, 5,000 blog views. Um, and in the first month, 2,700 images were downloaded. Um, we're approaching 9,000 now. Uh, we're surprised by the fact that it hasn't actually dropped off that much. Um, we're using Keen.io to uh, do the surveys and track as much metrics as we can about the downloads, and we're also using Google Analytics. Um, so we, this is the downloads from Google Analytics. So you can see, yep, there's a big spike there, but then there's lots of little spikes, and there doesn't really seem to be any big particular reason for any of them. It's just, it's uh, organic activity. And it's a lot higher than I was thinking it would be. I was hoping for 5,000 in a year. Um, we're at six months now and we're approaching 9,000. Um, so we, didn't, we just didn't really know what to expect, I guess. Um, and these are from Excel, so I'm sorry. Um, so what has, why, why were they downloaded? So most people just skip the question, but we do get 25% of them answering the question. So it's a fairly average um, spread of reasons, uh, but 7% personal, that's, that's good. Um, you know, blah, a book is only 38 downloads, you know, so we're really losing a lot of revenue out of that. Um, and then by license type, kind of not surprising, I guess, the, um, no, the less restrictive images are being downloaded more, but also the fact that the photography collection is generally that, and the photography collection is always going to be possible, uh, more, um, you know, that thing, um, as you can see here. Um, so this is the breakdown by collection. Um, so uh, one archaeozoology download, which isn't that bad because we've hardly got any archaeozoology collections. Um, 233 mollusks, that's pretty cool. Um, and art is always going to be second biggest in history. Um, it, this doesn't directly relate to the proportion of images that are available by those collections. Um, it's a number of influences that have impacted on that. Uh, these are the top images that were downloaded. Uh, so we have the three huia, we've got the Chinese kittens, um, we've got some Burton brothers. The problem with these is they're the images that we used for the marketing. Um, there goes that epilepsy thing. Um, so this is kind of meaningless um, because these are they're, they're false popularities, but there are a few that have crept in. The, the squid wasn't one we used um, to promote, so that's just naturally come to the top. Um, a few sort of textile things, but we don't, we, it's going to take a lot longer for us to figure out what's really popular. And, you know, it, it's quite a sort of gradual, um, it, well, there's a long tail, and the stuff that we promote is super popular, and then it flattens out across a whole lot of images. And we ask a few people about why they have downloaded them, so I don't think I would want to go to this meeting. Um, that's pretty cool and the kind of thing you would expect. Um, as this is an ancestor of Colenso, so that's pretty cool. Um, and that is a really high res download. Um, cool, we're going international and we're in the industry. Um, we are actively being part of um, education and research and Pacific. Um, we are, okay, <laughs> and you would expect that, but there was a little bit more to this one. Um, because they're actually wanting to use it to um, push the same project at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, and we like little congratulations, thanks. Um, this is the kind of example we didn't really think about. Um, and you know, why would we want to stop that kind of use by, by putting um, financial barriers in the way? I think it's really cool. Um, so we can see that it's, this is kind of science and art, um, and that's you know, again, our curators don't necessarily imagine that their science collections would be used in these ways. Um, but they're also being used in standard science ways as well. And we want to be part of people's social media lives and their internet lives and their online lives, and this is the kind of thing that we can now allow for. Um, this is an interesting one because this is actually an image of the UK. So this is a project looking at the um, the erosion of the intertidal zones from another country because we hold works that are relevant to them. Um, and by able, being able to promote them in high res, they can actually see a lot more than if we were just giving them a thumbnail. Um, I don't know why they filled in the survey if they weren't sure. <laughs> but then we had real life use as well. Um, this was actually the invite for uh, an arts debate at Massey University just before the election. 
Um, we didn't know it was happening. Uh, it was actually Thomason who saw it and sent it on to me because she recognised the image. Um, they've attributed it appropriately and nicely, um, and it looks great. They also used it as the um, background. It was projected on the background of the debate throughout the entire debate, uh, and this was um, videoed and was streamed, so everyone who was watching this was seeing our hui in the background. And Heather um, actually sent me an email yesterday saying that she was basically really pleased that she was able to use it, and then she told the story of how they picked it, um, which is you know, really good, because the more information we have about these reasons that they use them and why they like them, um, the better we can try and serve them. Um, and you get some Facebook his history groups and that kind of thing, and that's fantastic, but you, know, you kind of expect that. Um, and then you've got Kerry Ann Lee, who we all saw before. This is an interesting one because, um, so she was able to create these out of our online collections. These are all downloaded. Um, she searched her collections online, downloaded them, and made a new work. The last commission that we did um, was with Andrew McLeod, and I had to spend 28 hours looking for images for him that he could reuse, download them, load them onto a hard drive, and give them to him. And he didn't even use 5% of them. Um, so I didn't have to do that. She could, at her leisure, um, create this fantastic work. And new artworks is always one of the arguments that we've had, that we want to enable new creativity from the things that we hold. Um, we're also able to be part of sort of lighter engagements. Uh, DPLA and Digital New Zealand are having an animated GIF competition. Um, and someone has used this reasonably um, simple image to create something less simple. It's sure, it's maybe not the most extravagant artwork in the world, but you know, they wanted to make this, and it's, it's great. They were actually able to combine three different images to create this. Um, and she gave a little explanation about why she did it, and which is all fine and good. But these are the words that we want to see. Um, so that's fantastic. She, we also found that she was making other gifts and, and having them in, in other places, um, other competitions. So she didn't actually uh, give us a link to this or anything. I did a Google image search and I found this. Um, and she actually made three or four different versions. There was one that uh, I'm not going to show. Um, <laughs> So what's next for imaging? Um, uh, Victoria has told me that I can say that we are going to be removing the ND from the licenses. Um, the, the NC will stay there for a little while, but you know, we'll gradually take that back. Um, we're at 45,000 images now, um, and I should say that we're moving to the ND. We've just got a little bit of technical work to do, but it, it shouldn't take too long. Um, everybody's working really hard, particularly Victoria. Um, we're going to add an embed option or, or blog this or something along those lines. We're going to um, potentially add the ability to, th you don't have to download just the, the biggest image, maybe you just want a 640, so we'll allow for that. Um, and we're going to contribute all the no known copyright images to um, Wikimedia Commons. I'm just having a little bit of technical issue with that. Um, and next also is data. So we're going to make it, all our data available as CC BY. Um, we're talking to the Giddy about um, making their vocabularies available in the way that we've used them as part of that data because they have recently um, made their data available as linked open data, so it's just a matter of making sure that we're on the same page. Um, we thought we'd take the easy route first, but it turns out the easy route is actually quite hard. Um, we were just going to go for CSV dumps and update them monthly. We forgot that our data was so complex and there's a lot of it, so um, we've dropped that and we're just going to move, start looking at an API. Um, so that people can research in ways that they want to, so that they can make things that we aren't resourced to do, um, or that isn't in our interests, um, and so that we actually become an enabler. So we need to analyse more. I mean, that is very quick through, but there, it's only a few examples as well. There are many more I could have shown you. Um, you just do not know what people are going to do with your images, so don't even try to guess. Um, just, make, just let it happen. Um, we were surprised with the numbers. We're happy with the variety of use. Um, we really should promote more. That's actually the first time we've done any promotion of collections online, um, and we got really good feedback. So um, no answer to Taonga Māori yet, um, but it's not an uncommon thing. Um, and now we're looking at what else can we open in terms of research presentations, things like that as well. Look at that. 26 minutes. Fantastic. Um, we didn't think he'd get through all those slides. It certainly didn't feel like 76. It felt more like 20. I could just keep watching those all day. Um, thanks very much, guys. So questions now. 
and please do wait for a microphone. Um, and if, could I ask somebody over on the right-hand side there, please to grab the microphone on the stand and to volunteer to be a mic runner on that side? Thank you so much. Here's our first question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Tim Jones from Christchurch Agri. Fantastic, all fantastic. But it seems to me that some of the uses that people have putting those high-res images to a low-res image would do just as well. And I wondered if you had any figures for the pre-June 2014 uh, downloading and use of your low-res images, which were there anyway for school projects and uh, whatever. There, there wasn't any download option. It was right-click. So we couldn't track it. Yeah. So no, not really. But anecdotally, um, we knew there was some going on with blogs and that kind of thing. But we also know that there were places that we weren't having any activity like GIF it up. Um, so no, not really. But yes, the internet age doesn't need the full res, but better to go over than under. That's what we thought. More questions? Bye. There in the middle. So, Adrian, how do you upload 25,000 images to Wikimedia Commons? Um, first, you try to contact someone to um, get permission to use the tools in the um, test site. Then you get really frustrated um, and you do some angry tweets. Um, and then you um, upload a couple manually and then you resign yourself to the fact that it's not going to be as simple as you thought it was going to be. Um, but there is an upload tool that Europeana have worked with um, Wikimedia on that apparently does work and is good, um, but it has been falling over a couple of times recently. But there, it's an active development. But it is just an XML um, export import kind of thing. So um, in theory, it shouldn't be too onerous. If we have to drip feed it, we will. But yeah. Hey, okay, thanks. I just have a, um, a question about attribution. Have you found any difference between being attributed as a creator and the actual institution? The, um, so we use a caption generator to, to generate the attributions that we want, and they're the same attributions that we use, and it includes um, title, maker, registration, production date, um, as well as the license and to papa and a link to the original. Um, I think that's about it. So it's very structured and is about both of us. Um, generally, from what we've seen in the examples, people have been following that exact format. Um, but I'm sure that there are other places where they, they've decided to attribute it slightly differently. But um, yeah, we'll just have to see how it goes, I guess. And just to clarify, hold on one second, please. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Any more questions? Over here. Oh, kia ora. Earlier on, you talked about um, how it fitted your objective, you know, the one with the mana taonga sharing with iwi. So can you just elaborate slightly on that about how you might see that's going to happen to help you make, you know, taonga more uh, accessible? Um, we've got a lot, a lot more work to do in that space. I mean, we, we haven't started a process. Um, I think the, the intention around mana tonga and sharing authority is, is to, for us to work alongside communities and individuals and others to make decisions regarding how those tonga are, are managed and used. Um, the process that we've gone through here wasn't a very formal kind of hardcore policy approach. We've tried to make, take pragmatic steps as we can and bring, bring the organisation along with us. Um, we need more of a process around the Taonga Māori and the images of Māori subjects, and that process is still reasonably in its early days, um, but it's something we need to work through. But the principle is there, and I think in the digital age, it, it, this sort of open access really supports that principle really well. Thanks. Right, it's... Uh Time for coffee, I'm sure you'll all be glad. Can we just have a final round of applause for Phil and Adrian, please?